It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. So lots of activity going on on the picket lines. And, well, fortunately for some, not getting out on the picket lines. I look at the film producers and the people who work on making magic for the the big screen and the little screen. Uh, I guess there were, what, uh, some 40,000 of them potentially going to go on strike. Uh, that has been averted. But, uh, you know, as I'm looking at the vote, it was fairly narrow. So I'm I'm curious to find out what the membership thinks, uh, how it was as narrow as it was. And is this a good deal or a bad deal for the members of IATSE? That's why I've asked Alex Press to come talk with us. Alex is a staff writer over at Jacobin Magazine. She's been following this uh, extensively. Uh, Alex, thanks for taking time for us. Yeah, always happy to talk to you, Rick. So this was a fairly narrow uh, you know, ratification, no? Very narrow, in fact. So it's actually, it was 60,000 people who would have struck. Had These are two contracts we're talking about in among IATSE, right? So that's the below-the-line workers, the people who hold the cameras, do hair and makeup, all of that stuff um, in film and TV. And so the combined contracts covered 60,000 people. And actually, the bigger of the two, which is called the basic and covers some 40,000 people, actually, by popular numbers, just the raw vote was voted down. But because IATSE has this very arcane electoral college style voting system, um, which we I can explain if need be, but let's just say it's not one vote is, you know, it's not raw numbers that decide whether a contract is accepted. Um, so even though the majority of members voted down the basic, it passed. Um, and similarly, the ASA is the other one, the Area Standards Agreement. That one also super close. So it was a pretty split vote, almost 50-50. Um, and so a lot of members are very unhappy that this was ratified, especially the fact that the basic is, you know, some of them feel it's being forced on them, right? Because the majority said no, right. and it's still been ratified. Now, now, some of the main complaints I remember, you know, time off, uh, breaks, you know, you know, things more, more about, you know, breaks and, and family life balance than wages and benefits, as I remember. Uh, has any of that been addressed? No. Um, so everyone's concerns when this a tentative agreement first came out have not been fixed by any means, right? So they were right about being concerned with those um, highlights that they got when the agreement was first sort of settled almost a month ago. Um, and actually, you know, I was speaking to a former IATSE local president this morning on a radio show, actually, and he pointed out that, you know, while wages weren't the primary concern here, the agreement is just 3% raises a year, which is less than inflation. So, I mean, there are real concerns even about wages, too. Um, but yeah, I mean, time off is another one. People get 10 hours in this contract from when they have to leave work to, you know, drive home, go to bed, eat dinner, see their family and drive back only 10 hours, right? In LA with the traffic, that really means you're probably getting six hours of sleep at most. Um, and so that's still the concern, right? They didn't get more. And so a lot of members voted this down because they thought this is how we can ask for more, right? This is how we can get our leadership to come back to the table without getting any kind of violations for bargaining and bad faith because um, the leadership had only asked for those 10 hours, right? And so they're saying, you know what? We've moved. Our expectations have raised. We have to vote this down so that there's a mandate for them to go back and ask for more. Um, so people are very upset, right? Um, because they felt that this was their moment. They had all this attention. There's a tighter than usual labor market. And there's a sense that they could have set standards for the other unions in Hollywood that are also going to bargain their contracts soon. They could have really won something big here instead of settled for something mediocre. So is this, this is over then? I mean, there's, there's no potential of, you know, the, the membership going, no, we're, 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 we're rising up against this. This is it's a done deal. I mean, I never say never about workers being able to do whatever they want, but yes, I mean, basically it is a done deal. The, the contracts have been ratified. You know, there's other contracts now on the East coast in IATSE that are about to be negotiated. But as far as these contracts go, you know, this is the deal. Um, and so members are already talking about like, how do we change leadership? How do we reorganize this union? So that's more democratic, things like that. Um, and so in that sense, there's still motion, but on these contracts, people feel, you know, they have to accept this. This is what the union structures is. Yeah. This um, so is where, you know, when I, when I was reading through some of it, I'm going, you know, this is, you know, unfortunately this is what it is. This is, you know, what, what you get. And this is why you begin organizing because unions are democracy in the workplace. If you're not happy with the union leadership, you throw the bums out. And like anything, if you're not happy with them, replace them and then move forward, uh, which is what, you know, from what I'm, I'm getting from you, that's what I think is going to is, is happening. Yeah. And, you know, with the result being that the majority voted against a contract and still been ratified, it brings to mind the UPS contract. 
um, within the Teamsters Union, right? So that's the oh, biggest yeah. private sector contract, quarter million people under that contract, probably more now, actually. Um, and, you know, in 2018, the majority of the membership that are covered by that contract voted against it. And there was Hoffa did a really nasty move and imposed it anyway, something called the two thirds rule within the Teamsters. Um, that's very convoluted. We don't have to go into it. But what they did was at the Teamsters convention this year, they got rid of that rule. Um, and so I expect, given all of the anger around this result, that there may be some tweaks to the actual structure of IATSE itself to ensure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, again, this, you know, the, the two thirds rule, and I tell all my teams, your buddies, this, it's the reason you got to vote, man. I mean, we, we're just, we're, they're just going through an international election right now where less than, uh, less, less people voted this time around than last. I think it's just over 10% of the membership voted. Really? I hadn't I hadn't seen what the turnout numbers are coming in as for the Teamsters election. It certainly looks like the reform slate is going to win, I think. Yeah, I, I don't know that. I guess they're just starting to count. Yeah, they started it on the 15th and we'll know probably by the end of the week, maybe. But uh, as as the returns have come in, the, the numbers are, you go one out of one point four million people. You only got 10 percent to, to bother to take the moment just to put something back into the uh, into the into the post box. But then again, you know, we live in a society where, you know, we just had an election here not too long ago. You know, we're, you know what did you get? You know, 35, 40 percent of the population who was registered to vote to show up and only half of the people are registered. I mean, it's crazy. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's an important question because with IATSE, you know, part of what was unprecedented was when they took their strike authorization vote. Not only was it almost 99 percent of ballots in favor of a strike, but actually it was 90 percent turnout, which, as you mentioned, is pretty high turnout. It means people are really seriously engaged. You know, the contract vote, it was 72% turnout. So that's higher than IATSE's previous years, but it's not as high. So they lost some 18% of eligible members, right? Where did they go? And so some members have talked about how, you know, leadership didn't seem to really be pushing people to vote. In the lead up to the strike authorization, people were getting texts and phone calls all the time reminding them to vote. This time around, they said, at least some members, they weren't getting that sort of outreach from their local. Um, and so there's questions around that too. How do you get people to stay engaged and to begin you know, building something um, real? And I do think it's important that even though you know, the opposition didn't succeed and went out and reject the contracts here, the fact that they came so incredibly close with the full leadership united and recommending ratification, to me suggests, I mean, it was, I did not expect the no vote to be that high. Um, so there is some real organizing and building of networks going on here, both within locals and across locals. So I think the next couple of years in IATSE, anything could happen, really, as far as restructuring and a ch change in leadership. Yeah, no, no, because, you know, the number one issue is you wanted a little more time, uh, a time off, and that didn't get done. And, you know, some of the horror stories that I heard over the last several weeks, uh, you know, of people, you know, driving home, falling asleep and, you know, getting into accidents. And, you know, with this the thing that happened on the set of Rust, however that um, played itself out, you know, when people are tired, mistakes happen, accidents happen. It just seems, well, their number one issue didn't get addressed. Totally. And so people are mad about that. And people really see it as a life or death issue. Like this is part of their fury that they won't have any chance to redress this problem for three more years, right, until the contract's up again. Um, and I do think it's significant, not many people have sort of commented on this, but Helena Hutchins, who was the person who was killed on the set of Rust, was a local 600 member, and her local did vote down the contract. So I spoke to some members who said they voted no because of that incident. Um, they felt that, you know, they already were on the fence about the contract, and then they it became very clear to them that, you know, even if they had been unsure about how serious this problem was of a lack of safety of being overworked that made it crystal clear for them yeah because you know some of the stories that people were telling me were you know they're working 70 80 hours a week and you know you're you're, you're being banged back every 10 hours and and look you know I, I spent you know a lifetime in the trucking industry where that is kind of the norm uh and it's always been bad and i've always been right. against it and i've always said it's got to change um, and I don't want anybody to have to go through that. You, it, it goes back to, you know, I had an old Romanian friend who said he came to the U.S. because he wanted to work to live, not not to live to work. Uh, mm -hmm. where, where he lived in Romania, you, you grew up, you, you, were, you worked every day. That was your life. Uh, he mm -hmm. wanted his work to give him an opportunity to live. And this is kind of in that same vein to me. It's certainly how people talk about it, which is crazy, right? Because we're talking about making movies. We're not talking about even driving trucks or much less like, I don't know, being a doctor in an emergency room. I mean, this is making a TV show and people are sacrificing their entire lives, their families, their health for the sake of that. 
And, you know, I think one thing that has sort of deserves more attention here is that a lot of workers even within the industry think of it as the way it's always been, right? That this is just how movies work. Film production requires this, you know, no weekend, round the clock work. In fact, it's the product of a concessionary contract that passed in 1989 in IATSE, where they gave up weekends, they gave up night differential pay, they gave up all of these things in exchange for, guess what, a 3% raise just like this one. Um, and in fact, in that vote, you know, I sort of bring it up because the vote on that ratification was almost the exact split. So it was 51% of members voted against it versus 49 in favor. But because of IATSE's system of voting, the electoral delegate system, it passed anyway. And so it's important to think about the fact that, you know, if the conditions are bad in the industry, workers can change it. It hasn't always been this way and it doesn't have, always have to be this no, way. And it shouldn't be. I mean, you know, I, I've always hated that comment. Well, it's, it's how we've always done it. And, and look, you know, I, I went through, you know, some nonsense that because this, this is how it's always done. I don't want the next generation to have to do the kind of nonsense that I had to go through being on call for. I was on call for 11 years. Uh, you know, and they would call you two hour work call. You had two hours to get from wherever you were to work at the drop of a hat. And, and they go, well, that's how it's always been done. Yeah, it's always been done wrong. You should right. change that. Exactly. And so I, I think one outcome that's good here is that members did get a sense that, you know what, we're fed up and we can change things just because it didn't happen. This contract does not mean that the moment is passed, right? The moment is what workers make of it. Um, and so I could see that changing in the future. And we're, so where do you think things go now? Will this will this calm down for the short term and, and you'll see the organizing under the table? Or uh, is this this is an over issue, right? Again, I think, yeah, 99% chance that this just moves on into intra-union organizing, right? So organizing to deal with local elections, to deal with enforcement of these contracts as meager or imperfect as they may be. That said, Local 52 is the one in New York City for IATSE. And they're a very strong union. You know, they sort of in the, have a stronger history within IATSE as being a very kind of outspoken local. And they're about to deal with their contract, right? So who knows what happens? You know, usually these days it goes that they just kind of copy what was accepted in the Hollywood contract. But, you know, who knows what that looks like. So I'm sure that's sort of the short term next thing that people will see. So possibly this is where they, you know, they make a stand going, we're not going to get treated like that, like them. And maybe you do see something else. Something. It's possible. Yeah. And I think, again, you know, the sort of the, the cat's out of the bag about people being unhappy with the industry's working conditions. And given the incredible visibility of film and TV workers, even the ones who are usually behind the scenes, you know, I think it's hard to shut them up now that they've started speaking. So, like I said, what conser gets considered normal going forwards, I think, could be very different than what has been for the past few decades. So now the big picture issue on this, because, you know, I've had a couple of people go, well, you know, you know, see the union didn't get anything and they screwed over their members. The messaging that comes out of this is along those lines. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's very complicated. I mean, I think there are real problems with their electoral college style voting system, right? You know, it's actually the numbers came out today and it's really fascinating. The other, the smaller contract, which is still pretty big, it covers 20,000 people, the ASA. It turns out because of the delegate system, if four people in New Mexico had voted differently, it would have failed to pass, even though the majority of members would have voted for it. So this is so nonsensical, right? I mean, unions are sort of stake their claim on being democratic. So I think that's one thing that sucks about IATSE that needs to change, or at least needs to get, you know, members need to decide how they actually want to structure their union. But I don't think necessarily that it's a clear cut story of like the leadership screwed over the membership. I think it's really the case that the membership moved over the course of negotiations above and beyond anything any of the leadership expected, which is partially on them that they were a bit out of touch with their own members. But at the end of the day, the studios gave horrible offers. They forced that level of militancy by insulting the membership um, and the leadership, I think, did what they could to try to address it and they came short. Um, and so I do think that hopefully there will be a sort of changing uh, of leadership. But that said, I think the real enemies here are the studios that just work people through their lunch breaks and keep them on sets for 20 hours a day. Right. Because here's the, here's the part of this. And, you know, because I, I don't want the message to be, well, the union screwed over their members. No, this is the, this is, these are the studios. These are the em employers choosing these, these hours and, and abusing these people the way they do. Right. I do think, you know, sure, in the like communications that the leadership put out throughout this process, there were some mistakes made and some lack of sensitivity. And I do think they could have gone back and asked for more on certain of these issues. But at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, this is what it is to be engaged in your union. A lot of workers 
have been members of unions for years and they don't know their contracts, they don't know their structures, and then they get mobilized and energized and they start running into these problems within the union. And it's up to the membership to change them, right? So this is partially just an inherited structure within IATSE that's sort of to blame here rather than any specific leader. And look, that's not just IATSE. That's, you know, you go across the board. I mean, you look at the, the workers at John Deere who are, you know, not thrilled with the UAW. I mean, it's kind of the same same environment. Yeah, I mean, I do think that's one of the interesting things at like a broader level of talking about the labor movement right now in this country is that there is a sort of sense of the rank and file leading on certain issues, leadership having to catch up and anti-democratic structures being discarded or reformed. So, I mean, we think about the UAW referendum that's going on, you know, about having direct election of um, the leadership. That's one that's, you know, a no brainer to me as far as something that needs to change. And again, that comes from rank and file sort of anger and determination. And so I think that is the trend is that we're seeing a lot of workers take a look at their own unions and say, you know what, we could fix this, make it even better. Um, and to me, that's about, you know, workers feeling like they, you know, that they're getting a sense of their own power over the past year, especially. And that's where I want to be. I, as someone who is a union activist and has been a union member for over 30 years, uh, it is my union. It's not the union. It's it's my union. And and this is where workplace democracy is, is important. And you do need to have educated, active, engaged members, uh, just like, you know, like a country. You need active, engaged, uh, intelligent, informed citizens saying, same thing with workers in their unions. To me, it, it's the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And in that sense, I mean, the IATSE transformation of the membership over the past like six months has just been incredible and does bode well, even if it didn't quite get over the finish line of rejecting a mediocre contract. Right. So I think it's not the end of the story. And it's, in fact, very good. It's probably there's probably some leaders in IATSE who are thrilled about this. Right. Because so often, you know, there's a disengaged membership right now. That is not the problem in IATSE. No, no, absolutely. You need people to, uh, to be active and engaged. But Alex, I appreciate the work you do as always. Great stuff. Great work you do out there at Jacobin Magazine. Hope you'll come back and share some more thoughts with us in the future. Of course. Thanks so much for talking to me, Rick. Good stuff. Our good friend Alex Press. Make sure you check out her work. We'll get links out on social media. You can check out what she does there at Jacobin. Quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. 